on in, as, in the aftermath of these storms, we really need to continue to lift our brothers and sisters up in prayer. You might not know this, but we have quite a few Seventh Aminists in Puerto Rico, and so um, I'd like to continue to lift them up in prayer and to do what we can to help. Uh, I know we often want to send stuff down there, but usually the best thing to do is to send it, send money through Adventist Community Services and Disaster Relief, and they'll get the folks what they need. So if you're wondering how to be involved in that, uh, maybe just let me know afterwards and I can steer you in the right direction or just look up Adventist Community Services and Disaster Relief online. So our topic today is Jesus calming the storm. Next time we're together, we'll be having communion and we'll be having a kind of a rubber meets the road little talk. It won't be a, a full sermon on our relationship with Jesus and how to develop that. Because a, a lot of times folks have struggled to even know how to pray, uh, how to spend time in the Word, uh, how to develop a relationship with Jesus. So we'll be looking at that together next time, and you won't want to miss that as well. It'll be kind of a segue into uh, our Adventist Heritage Month. So again, Jesus calming the storm. Let's pray together once again before we dive into God's precious Word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that entrance of your words does give light. It does give understanding. But we know the prerequisite is that we need to be simple because it gives light and understanding to the simple. And so, Father, we understand, at least I do, that I'm very simple, that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so we plead for the Holy Spirit to guide us into your word, that it would be a lamp to our feet, that it would shine in these dark paths that we see uh, us walking in these days to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, I had the privilege of staying in the Sea of Galilee area. In fact, you can kind of see this is the view from my hotel room. And down yonder, we went down and we actually went and had St. Peter's fish touch my feet. <laughs> but you notice I'm pointing to an area which you can't see because it's washed out. But over yonder, uh, this is over here to the left is Capernaum area and the, the Beatitudes area. And over to the right in this area here, which again, it's washed out. But you'll see my finger pointing at it. Uh, and this area right over here would be the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee. We're in Tiberias. Uh, and you can see my finger there. Yeah, I knew I was going to be preaching about this. And I, I usually plan my sermonic here in January. So I was looking for... When I heard one of the guides say, over there is where the pigs went off the cliff, <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to get a video of that. And so it's over yonder. <clears throat> For those of you who see uh, the TV here, it's probably a little bit clearer. Now here's another shot of the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus spent the majority of his time in rural areas. Sometimes we think, well, rural areas don't deserve our attention. Jesus spent more time in a rural area than anywhere else. Yes, thousands came out to him, but these towns were small towns. And so you, can, you have Magdala, you have Capernaum, you have the Mount of Beatitudes over here. And somewhere around here, Jesus got into a boat and went over to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Here's another picture. Uh, this is Magdala, Capernaum. Or, yeah, so you, you're heading, he's heading onto the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Now with that in mind, I wanted to give you that visual because the Gospels, it's really interesting. This story that takes place appears in all three of what's called the Synoptic Gospels, or Synoptic are the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Gospels, the first three. John is considered, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke, excuse me. John is considered uh, not a Synoptic Gospel. Uh, he's kind of in a class him, by himself. But the three, first three Gospel writers, they include this story that we're going to read here about this storm that's coming as they get ready, or as they cross the Sea of Galilee. Matthew chapter 7 I want us to look at the different accounts because they each give a little nuance to what went on here. To the Holy Spirit, they were impressed to write down certain little aspects of the same diamond, if you will. But, you know, diamond has many different cuts on it. And so you have here in Matthew a different, uh, not necessarily a different picture, but a, a little nuance that's a little bit different than Mark and Luke. And they all have contribute to make a nice, beautiful gem, if you will, of truth. Matthew 7, verse 24 says, uh, and this gives you the background to the storm. And I think this is important because as Jesus is finishing his Sermon on the Mount, he could have finished it any way he wanted to. 
And now his sermon wasn't very long. It probably, uh, you know, was, you know, most people think that they can half an hour at the most. So I kind of wonder why I go a little longer than that. But anyways, maybe I can get it down to 20 minutes someday, my sermons. But he finishes it any way he wants. This is his sermon. He has been led by the Father through the Holy Spirit to say these words, and he ends it this way in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came. This is storm language okay, that he uses. And he's, he, he's very uh, intricate about how he's describing this. He's purposely describing this storm. So you can picture it in your mind. The rain descended, the floods came, so water's coming up. Okay. The winds blew, you can picture it in your mind, and beat upon that house. That is, it's hitting it over and over and over again. Beat upon that house. And it fell not. It fell not. Why? Because it was founded upon the rock. So there you have this one class. He ends his sermon talking about a storm. One group of people hear his sayings and they do them. Of course, not in their own power. It's him working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. But there's a second class. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine, of Jesus, in other words, and does them not. Does them not. This describes the majority of humanity does them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the water's coming up, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And not only did it fall, Jesus says, and great was the fall of it. Now this is the context of what's going to happen in Matthew chapter 8. Eight. You know, he does all these healings. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 8. But verse 23 says these words. When he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with waves, but, but he was asleep. a graphic picture when you think about it. If you just wrap your mind around it just for a moment, a great tempest in the sea. Okay, now this is something that's startling to Matthew, the tax collector. This is startling for him to experience this. Insomuch that the ship was, what, covered with the waves. That is very descriptive. So can you picture the scene in your mind, this little boat, and uh, I... We'll show the boat in a few moments. It's not very big. This little boat being covered with these waves, but he, that's Jesus, was asleep. Talk about not answering the phone at 2 o'clock in the morning. Here he is, huge tempest, a great tempest, and he is asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said to them, Why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now turn to Mark. Mark adds a little nuance, a little caveat, if you will, a little glistening gem here. Mark chapter 4 describes this as well. Mark chapter 4, and starting at verse 33, and with many such parables he spake the word to them as they were able to hear it. So this gives you a context. He was teaching them. Matthew says he just finished the Sermon on the Mount. He just talked about this storm, and now, guess what happens? The same day when evening was come, he said to them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude... They took him even as he was in the ship. I'm going to pause there just for a minute. Oftentimes we will skip over words in the Bible. It says, even as he, that's Jesus, was. Even as he was. How was Jesus when they took him in the ship? Well, Matthew says he fell asleep and he 
apparently was so tired that when the storm is coming, he is still asleep in the boat. Mark says they took him even as he was. How was he? He was tired. He'd been ministering to thousands and thousands of people. And he said, let's go on the other side. Why? Why would he want to go on the other side? Well, there's a reason why. We'll get to that in a moment. But part of it is he wants to get away from the people. And the other gospel writer says, well, they got their boats and they're following him too. And so can you picture not only Jesus' boat in the storm, but all these other little boats, we're told, uh, in the storm as well. They took him even as he was. And I was, I was just thinking about this. I thought, you know, this gives me a deeper appreciation for Jesus. He was a man and he was divine. But he laid aside his divinity. He took on humanity. Was he hungry at times? Yes, he was. Was he tired? Yeah. This time he's exhausted. He's so exhausted that when they hit the boat, he hits the pillow. Literally. And it says they took him as he was, and there were also with him other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship. So now it was full. Who is giving Mark his information? It's Peter, we believe. Peter, of course, is going to tell you that not only were the waves beating in, the ship is becoming full. <laughs> and this is a great storm. This is coming from the fisherman, the fisherman Peter, who had seen many different storms through his time. And he, that's Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. So he literally hits the pillow and goes to sleep in the boat. He's so exhausted. He's so exhausted. Are you ever exhausted like that? Jesus has been there. He knows our infirmities. And they woke him as they see him asleep on the pillow. They're trying all they can to save themselves. They're pulling out every, every method in the book, so to speak. Every storm that they'd encountered to this point in time, they've been able to somehow get out of it. But this time, it's, it's a great storm. They cannot get out of it no matter what they do. And they finally realize, oh, Jesus is with us. Oh, he's back there asleep on the pillow. I guess we better go get him. In fact, here's what they say. Master, carest thou not that we perish? You don't care about us. You don't care about us? Don't you care that we're perishing here? We've tried everything in the book. We're perishing. And he, that's Jesus, arose. Now, Matthew doesn't tell you the words that Jesus used. It just says he rebuked the wind. Here it says he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. Now, oftentimes we say it like that. Literally, it means be quiet. Or it could be literally translated, shut up. Okay, my wife doesn't want to use that terminology, doesn't want me to use that terminology, but that, that's literally what it means. Zip it, in other words. Be quiet. It's a command in the original. It's an imperative. It's like a superior giving an order to somebody below them. He gives the order, and the sea obeys. It ceased, the wind ceased, and there was a great Calm. A great storm becomes a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? How much faith did they have according to Jesus? Zero, zip, nada. He says, no. There's no qualifications here. You want to know why? At this point in time, they had not been totally converted yet. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, what matter of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? But Mark adds a few more details. You can read it in chapter 5. But I wanted to throw the boat up on the screen. I shared this with you before. This is some of the, the remnants of the boat that, were, that they found. It's, this isn't Jesus' boat, but it dates back to his time. This is not a large boat at all. It could fit 13 people in there. It would be very snug. Uh, this does date back to Jesus' time. Uh, they have reconstructed what they have left of it. But can you imagine the scene? Going from something like this, like when I was in the Sea of Galilee, to something like this. I mean, that's quite a, uh, I know it's washed out, but it's quite a, quite a change. Quite a change from going from calm, so calm that Jesus falls asleep in the back of the boat, to this great storm. And what does it say? 
What does it say when they wake up Jesus? He speaks, and that storm, that tempest, that great storm where the waves are crashing into the, into the boat and filling it, as Peter told Mark, it was becoming full of water. He speaks, and it becomes calm. Quite a picture. Now, my question is this. Why did Jesus need to cross over to the other side? Was it just so he could have a retreat? Yes, that's part of it. He was tired. He's trying to get away from the people. But more than that, and this helps us understand when storms come into our lives, why they come. Why do you think the storm was there? I believe it was to prevent Jesus from getting to the other side because Mark tells you something happened on the other side. In fact, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. As, as they're sailing now through smooth waters over to the other side, it says, As they came unto the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. I wasn't able to get any uh, fancy shots, but this is somebody's artist's rendition of it. Can you imagine that? Now, this is probably not totally accurate because the idea is he's already been off the ship. They've come to, this, to the shore, and this man comes running at Jesus. Can you imagine Peter and James and John and Andrew? These tough guys are afraid of this guy. They fall back, and Jesus is unafraid. Jesus came through the storm of the waters because there was a man going through a personal storm. The same words that were spoken to that storm needed to be spoken to this man, and that's why the storm came. So we wonder, why are these things happening to us? Why are these storms coming? We need to think outside of ourselves. The storm came to Jesus, the perfect one, the one who knew no sin. Sometimes we bring storms on ourselves. He didn't bring it on himself. It, it came because Satan wanted to prevent Jesus from getting to the other side because there was a man there with an unclean spirit, with no hope, empty. He'd been, he, he'd been living in tombs, and he'd been sabotaging and ravaging that whole area, so much so that the people lived in fear. Lived in fear. And Jesus knew that that man, deep inside of him, wanted to be free. He was free from that storm. And before I forget, I forgot to announce at the beginning, I'm going to give an opportunity at the end of our time together, just a brief opportunity that if you have a storm in your life, if you have a storm in your life, pray about it. But if you have a storm in your life that you want to give to Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come forward at the end and have special prayer. It might be a storm inside, it might be a storm outside, but I'm going to give you that opportunity as we conclude our time. This man had a storm inside, an unclean spirit. In fact, the Bible says a legion of unclean spirits are in him. How much is a legion? From 2,000 to 5,000 Roman soldiers. Depending on how much uh, the Romans wanted to, to devote to a legion, that between two and 5,000, anywhere between there. Some say even up to 6,000 a legion. So probably, uh, we're told that probably there was about 2,000 demons in this guy. 2,000 demons. One demon is so powerful, more powerful than a human being, that's for sure, that it can throw a little boy under the fire, right? We saw that when they come from the Mount of Transfiguration down, the, the father begged the disciples to cast the demons out. They couldn't do it, and so Jesus does it, and that boy was thrown in the fire oftentimes, it says. Demons are more powerful than human beings. Picture the scene then. Why are there 2,000 demons in this guy? Why would the... We need to think in military terms. Why would the armies of Satan, there's armies of heaven, we see that in Daniel chapter 4, you also see it through the Psalms. David is a military man. He realizes there's an army in heaven. Why would the armies of Satan devote 2,000 of their forces to this one man? Don't you think that's a waste of time? Don't you think that's a waste of resources? Unless they knew that this man, this man was a threat to them. This man, if he gave himself completely to God, would be a severe blow to their empire. 
2,000 angels are devoted to this man because he's a threat. This man had opened his heart to the demons. Now you say, well, how does that happen? And they came in, and they came in in full force, 2,000 of them. How does that happen? You know what still happens this, to this day? We don't want to talk about it because we don't want to step on anybody's toes, but also because we live in a first world country. Prideful. You go overseas and you, you go to Seventh-day Adventist churches and they will talk very plainly about this stuff going on. They will tell you that this happens, can happen a number of ways. A baby could be dedicated to the devil. Do you know that still happens to this day in Africa? Supposedly Seventh-day Adventist Christians who are dedicating their children to the devil. This literally happened, so much so that we had to add another fundamental belief in their fundamental beliefs to talk about how Jesus had power over the spirits. That's why that fundamental belief was added, because what was going on in Africa was people were becoming Seventh-day Adventists, or they were in the church all their lives, even as elders, and they were dedicating their children to the devil. They're trying to keep both religions, the tribal religion and Seventh-day Adventism. It's called syncretism in mission terms, mixing it together. That happens all the time. So it can happen, the child can be dedicated to the Lord or dedicated to the devil. It happens overseas, but it also happens right here. We don't want to talk about it, but who we give our children to, that's what they're dedicated to, isn't it? But also it happens through uh, brothers in Africa and other places will tell you that, and even here in America, it happens through the avenues of the soul, what we watch, what we listen to, what we allow into our lives. I remember there was a gal that came to me, and I had baptized her parents, and eventually I'd baptize, I would baptize her and her brother. A really wonderful Christian family. And I don't know, Jeff, you might want to uh, bring the lights up a little bit in the back, because I don't want to put people totally to sleep. But this gal came to me. Are you guys Okay. Okay, this gal came to me and says, I have a friend who at nighttime, something is grabbing her around the neck and trying to strangle her, but it's not a human being. What should I do? Now, I'm not going to get all into the devil stuff today, but what I'm saying is that was the, the question that came. I said, well, has she, I don't want to step on any toes, but this is what I said. It's not popular for pastors to say this, but it's, it's the truth. Because I'll tell you right now, when I was a teenager, and even before that, I started watching these movies where you look into a mirror and you say certain words, certain amount of times, and guess what happened? My life became a life of fear. My life became a life of fear. It wasn't until Jesus came into my life that that fear went away and I had a peace that has never left. But I lived a life of fear when I let that stuff in, and it came from watching movies, Okay? Do I step on any toes here? I hope, I hope I'm not, but the bottom line is I'm telling you from a, a person who was not a Christian myself, I became a Christian. I used to watch that stuff all the time. My life was filled with fear. I would see shadows everywhere. That's a terminology for the occult. I would see that stuff without Jesus in my life. I told that young guy, I said, if she's watching horror movies or anything else that's allowing Satan to come in, tell her to turn it off and that she needs to accept Jesus. That is politically incorrect, isn't it? A lot of people don't want to hear that, that they need to accept Jesus. You turn off those avenues and you accept Jesus. And some months went by and I remember asking the parents and the girl who had a friend who was the demon who was choking her, what's, what's the update? They said the, demons have went, the demon has went away. And turns out that that, that that was going on in her life. She was allowing the demons in. We don't want to talk about it in our first world culture, but the bottom line is, in the end, you will be possessed by one spirit or the other. The Holy Spirit or demon spirits. This man was possessed by demon spirits because he allowed an avenue for them to come in. They knew he was a threat to them. My brother looked into a mirror and told the devil, I'll be the worst person you ever had. And guess what? The devil came into his heart and he, he fulfilled that until he accepted Jesus. This man allowed the demons in. And the demons came in full force. But guess what? There's something very interesting here. There's something very interesting. If you look here, let's read in Mark 5. 
He'd been drawn among the tombs, verse 3. He'd been often bound with fetters and all of that. Always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying, cutting himself. It's a popular thing nowadays with stones. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he what? Worshipped him. That's Jesus. Worshipped Jesus. He runs to Jesus. He falls down and he worships him. The word there is falling prostrate before him. But guess what? When the man goes to speak, what comes out of his mouth? It's the demon voices. What have I do to do with you, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I had heard you by God that thou torment me not. These voices are coming out of him. He's worshiping Jesus inside. He, he wants to be set free. Does Jesus know that? Yeah, he knows the heart. We're told he knows what's in man. That man runs to Jesus even though he's being possessed by these thousands of demons, he falls before Jesus worshiping him, but out of his mouth comes demonic words. That's why we should not judge by the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. He worships Jesus. And as these demonic words come out of this man, Jesus says, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit, and he asked him, what is your name? Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away into the country, the abyss. But they were nigh unto the mountains. A great herd of swine was feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, send us, all these 2,000 devils, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. The unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked at the sea. So can you picture the scene? 2,000 of these pigs go flying off at in the, in the cliff, you know. Flying off. Now this man is clothed and in his right mind. He wants to go with Jesus. But guess what? Jesus says, no, go back. Go back, verse 19, go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. This man does that. But the delegation from Decapolis, Decapolis means 10 cities, Deca, 10, 10 cities. They say, get out of here, Jesus. Get out of here. But this man wants to go with Jesus. He says, no, go back and tell them what God has done for you, your family, your friends. They kick Jesus out. This demoniac goes back and tells what Jesus has done. And do you know what happens next time Jesus comes into the area? They receive Jesus. They're eagerly wanting him to come. They kick him out before, but now they're ready to receive him. Why? Because that demoniac had that storm of 2,000 demons inside is set free. Satan knew this would happen. That's why he tried to stop Jesus from going across the sea. That's why he brought the storm. Now this man does a storm of the gospel. All those 10 cities hear this man whose life has been changed. And now when Jesus comes back later, they receive him with open arms. They receive him with open arms. Quite a story, isn't it? Quite a beautiful story. If God has changed our lives, we will share it, and we will share it over and over and over again. So what about these storms? These storms we find outside of ourselves often. They come from the outside. I put Jesus is in our boat, but we neglect him, though. You know, these storms come and we say, why, Lord, why, Lord, why, Lord? And he's right there the whole time in our boat, so to speak. Why were the disciples rebuked by Jesus? Because they were afraid. And why were they afraid? They were afraid to die. They were afraid to die. They had not been converted yet. And so when we are not converted, when, when, even when we have Jesus in the boat, so to speak, we have chosen to follow him, but we haven't chosen to be converted. And I know that seems like an oxymoron, but they chose to follow Jesus. They weren't converted until after the cross. Sometimes we have good intentions. And Jesus is there all the time, but we neglect him. We try everything else, and then we go run into Jesus. And I find that often. You know, sometimes uh, I'll hear people, and a lot of them have had some medical background, and I understand medicine is good. 
But oftentimes they'll wait till they went to 12 doctors or whatever, and then they'll ask for an anointing. Do you know in the Adventist church when we had anointings, they used to happen quite often, and oftentimes they preceded the doctoral visits. <laughs> We're like that, though. We're just like the disciples. We try everything else, and then we're going to try Jesus. We come to Jesus as a last resort. But guess what? How does Jesus treat us? Come on, guys. You neglected me. You waited till the last minute. You tried everything else. Now you're going to try me? Come on. No, he doesn't do that. When we ask for help, he gets up. And yeah, he gives a rebuke after, after he speaks peace, but he speaks peace. That's what they needed. And then he'll give the rebuke afterwards. As they're standing in awe, they can now take the rebuke. These storms from the outside, that's what the disciples were experiencing. The water coming into the boat. They were in such a lost condition even though Jesus was right there with them. Even though they knew Jesus, about him at least. They didn't know him as a personal savior, but they knew about him. What about the storms inside like that demoniac? You know, he needed Jesus. He was afraid to live or to die. And that's quite a position to be in. Jesus comes to us when we're like that. He comes to us. We see him. We run to Jesus. Maybe the man heard second or third hand in all those cities in Decapolis. Word spreads. He was a savage. He running through there. Maybe he heard inklings about Jesus. But he runs to Jesus when he sees him. He recognizes this is the one, the only one that can help me. And he asks for help. And what does Jesus do? He comes in and he speaks peace to that man. He comes into his heart. So much so that this man is no longer ashamed of anything. He's clothed in his right mind and now he can go and share with others what Jesus has done. We have storms from the outside. We have storms in the inside. Jesus speaks peace to both. He really does. Are we afraid to die? There are people that are afraid to die. There are people that will sometimes, if they get to such a low point, will tell you they're afraid to die. Oftentimes they won't. And I think sometimes when, the, when people see pastors coming to visit them in the hospital, they kind of picture them like, you know, the plague doctors. Like we're coming to help you die or something, you know. We're coming to help you live. Yeah, the, it's not a last right to have the pastor visit you in the hospital. I don't wear the plague doctor's mask or anything like that. But I remember one guy told me he was afraid to die. He told me, I'm afraid to die. And I'm standing there by his bed. What should I do? What can I do? Can I help this guy? The thought came, Marion, you need to share with him. Well, what if the nurse comes in? They always come in, seem like the, just the worst times sometimes. This nurse is my wife is one. But, but they always come in, they're always busy, you know, all the time. I kind of wonder how the patient's ever going to get rest, but because they're poked and prodded all the time. I know there's good intentions to keep monitoring them and all that. I thought, well, if I start it, I'm going to get interrupted. And I almost chickened out. I almost chickened out and I almost didn't say anything. I remember this. I was like, no, say it. Say it. And so I said, you know, there was a time when I was afraid to die. And I shared my testimony, which you probably heard it over and over again since I've been here last year or so. I shared that with him. I said, I was afraid to die. I was afraid to go to bed at night. I was afraid, even when I was in jail, to get out of jail because of what I might face from other people. But I accepted Jesus in my life. I said, I've tried everything else. So I'm going to give you a chance in my life. And you know, I told him a peace came in my heart that has never left. I said, if you accept Jesus, you might die the first death, but you will have peace. And you will have, you won't die the second death. You will have eternal life after that. I said, do you want to have peace in your life? Do you want to invite Jesus in? The person said, yeah. And so I stood there and I said, okay, I, I will pray an, an introductory prayer. And at a certain time, because some people don't know how to pray. Do you understand that? Some people don't know how to pray. Okay. 
Uh, when I was teaching little third graders over in Thailand, uh, they didn't know how to pray. I would pray and they would repeat. And so I said, I will pray a prayer. And I'll pray and you'll repeat. Is that okay? He said, yeah. And so I, I inter- introduced the prayer and then we went through this prayer of accepting Jesus in. And I, I, I don't remember my exact words, so I'm not going to say them. But I said, whatever the Lord pressed me to say, no Billy Graham prayer, I don't have a prayer memorized, but I, it was for, the, for this person to accept Jesus, to have peace, to acknowledge that he's afraid to die, he wants to have peace in his life. And when I got done, that person's face shone. I don't, I, they, they didn't go look in the mirror, but I looked at their face, and you could see a marked difference between before and after, just moments what made the difference? It wasn't my hobnodge prayer, fumbling here and there and everywhere. It was Jesus speaking peace to that person, and they accepted it by faith. If we have the Son, we have life. If we have the Son, we have a peace that the world cannot give. Claim those promises with Him. So we might be afraid to die. Maybe our finances are the storm. Maybe our health, maybe our relationships are in shambles. Maybe we feel empty inside. Maybe we are faced depression. Whatever your storm is, whatever it is, from the outside or from the inside, maybe you've allowed it in, Jesus can speak peace to it. He speaks peace to me every day of my life. When I go to Him in prayer, that is a place of peace, a peace that never ends, a peace that bays over my soul. Whatever your storm is, He can speak peace to that storm. You know, speaking of storms, the Dakotas are notorious. You know, winter and spring storms in the Dakotas are nasty. If you get stuck in a spring storm, that is a bad place to be. Because not only is it cold, not only is... uh, the snow pouring down, but usually you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's not like where you got towns here and there and everywhere. How'd you like to walk in something like this? Oh, can't see anything. Okay, well, that's what it says. Maybe you can look there on the screen. That's a whiteout up there, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe this one you can see. I remember I was traveling from North Dakota. I lived in Minot up here. And I was traveling down to South Dakota over here. Because my wife and kids, we lived in Minot, North Dakota. She wanted to fly back to Malaysia, but it was going to cost, I think it was like six or $700 more to fly out of Minot or Bismarck than it would be out of Rapid City, South Dakota, where we used to live, that area. And we had friends in Rapid City. So I said, well, let's, you just fly out of Rapid City, and you will... Uh, when you come back, I'll come, I'll come back down and pick you up. So I dropped them off. I went back to North Dakota. Uh, I think a month or so later, I came back down. But before I came down, my elder called me, and he says, you better get on the road because there's a storm coming. And you better get down there because you, you might not make it down there. You know what? I should not have listened to him. <laughs> I had two days to get down there. I thought, well, okay, I'll listen. No, I'll go down a day or a day and a half early, and that way, you know, I'll just, I have friends down there. I'll go visit them and stuff like that. And so I headed out at the elder's request. I won't name him <laughs> in case he watches it on YouTube. And I remember hitting Bismarck and going, uh, going west, and my car or my van, minivan, it was a Honda minivan, started going like this all over the road, you know, zigzagging around. It had rained and become ice, and the wind had started picking up. But I said, I got to go. This, this thought came, I got to go. Got to beat this storm. And then I got down to the North Dakota, South Dakota border. I didn't know that this storm had, uh, had spread so far. And I could hardly see anything. I thought, well, I better get gas. I was probably a little above a quarter tank at the time. I said, well, I better get some gas. But I went to go stop at a gas station. I got stuck in the parking lot. There's nobody out there. They expect you, you, you pump your own gas there, you know. 
Uh, and, and you put your own card in and stuff. So nobody's out there, and I thought, well, this is crazy. I'm just going to keep going. And I, I rock the van back and forth. You know how you do that with you know, you're pumping the pedal, going, trying to go back and forth, trying to get unstuck in that parking lot, and I said, I'm going to keep going then. I thought, I'll get down to Belfouche, and then I'll get gas down there. And so I got out of the parking lot. It got so intense, this, this storm, that I, I know this sounds really stupid. This sounds so stupid that you'd probably want to kick me in the pants. But I rolled down my window and was sticking my head out to see, make sure I was going down on the right side of the road. It got so bad that I actually ended up opening my door. I know. And I was going like five miles an hour. Okay. It got so bad. That's how crazy it was. But this, this urging was go, move, keep going forward, keep going, going forward. It got so bad I finally said, I can't go any forward, forward anymore. And I went to pull over, and I saw two headlights, or, uh, uh, you know, two lights over there. There was a car parked. They were in the same predicament as I said. I'm going to stay right here. At least there's somebody else here. I don't know where I'm at. And so I wait there, and it's 60 to 80 mile an hour winds. I find out later. I didn't know at the time. And I wait overnight, and what you do, you know, you turn your car off. You turn it back on. You turn your car off. Turn it back on. It was a little bit above a quarter tank. Now it's getting lower than that. And I, well, I hope this storm hurries up and gets over with. And in the morning, I managed to hobble out there, and it's still, it is intense. I got my best coat on, and I'm, I'm trying to block the wind from, you know, hitting the snow on my face. And I go over, and I, I hobble over there, and I look down his window. He's in one of these little tracker, four-wheel drive trackers. And it, I said, what do you want to do? He says, well, let's go. I don't have a lot of gas. And I said, I don't either. I said, let's go. Let's find a gas station. I got four-wheel drive, he says. Picture a little geo-tracker, okay? You can picture a geo-tracker in your mind. Four-wheel drive. So we start hitting these uh, drifts that are near these bridges and, and keep going, and, and you know, the snow hits your windshield. You just have to keep going until that snow clears, and you, and you keep going, and you keep going. We got to a gas station, and we couldn't get our cards in there. The rain had frozen all over the, the top of those things. And so he said, let's keep going, let's keep going. And so we kept going, and we hit this bridged area, and I said, there's no way this guy is going to get across this bridge. It was long, and the drifts were deep. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about that deep, literally that deep of snow that had been drifted onto that bridge. There's no way this guy is going to get across with that geo tracker. And I, I slammed on my brakes, and I watched him as he hit that, and he hit it in the worst possible spot. You know how the drifts, sometimes they're lower on one side? He didn't hit that side. He hit right in the middle of it, and he bottomed out. I'm getting to my point in a minute here. At that point in time, he got out with a shovel, and he started to try to shovel out. I mean, this guy's probably in his 60s at the time. And I remember the wife getting out, and, ye and I, I went to get over there and try to help him. She's yelling at him as I got closer. She's yelling at him, and she looks at me. He's a heart patient. He shouldn't be out here. <laughs> and so I said, give me the shovel. I'll do it. So he got, gave me the shovel. Okay, I will. You know, these North Dakotans, and they want to do the work themselves. And so I started trying to get him out. I couldn't get this guy out. I said, I, I Gave him back his shovel. I said, I can't help you here. I went back to the van. It was so cold that the sweat from my face had turned into icicles from my nose and all across. That's quite an experience. I said, I'll call 911 before I left. I said, I'll call 911. He said, well, I can't. We tried. We can't get out. We got this little track phone. We can't. There's nothing. I said, I'll try. And so I tried, and I got somebody. And they said, stay where you're at, and if you have to, you know, use your vehicle until it runs out of gas, and then use theirs. And so I remember calling the conference president. He sent out an email. And I want to mention this gal's name because she deserves to be honored because God used her. Her name was Phyllis Alexander. Now she's uh, up there in years. She's way past retirement. But she was our disaster relief coordinator at one point in time. I was her pastor at one time. She gets the email. And the conference president says, pray for Pastor Miller. And she says, pray? What? We'll pray, but we need to do something. And so she calls the state troopers that she knows, and uh, she calls different people and higher-ups, and they said, well, it's going to be a day and a half before we even get out there. So I got a, less than a quarter tank. They had less than that. That's not going to last a day and a half. And I remember 
uh, she said, just hang on. Just hang on. We'll do what we can. I went and told this guy. He got back out and was shoveling again. <laughs> this poor guy. He's going to have a heart attack, I thought. And what are we going to do? Wait a day and a half? I told him, get back in your vehicle. They're sending help. I finally got confirmation they would be there in the afternoon. And I was getting really hungry at that time. And I looked at my little wiener dog. She was with me. Uh, we'd been cuddling up together to keep warm. And I said, I, yeah, I have water, but I didn't bring any food. I looked at her, and she looked at me. <laughs> There's a standing joke because of this in our family. I looked at her, and she looked at me with her big eyes, you know, wiener dog eyes. <laughs> and I said, Coco, I'm going to have to eat some of your food. <laughs> and I actually got some dog food, and I... I used to eat dog food when I was a kid, so it's nothing new, I guess, but, but I ate dog food. And my brother, the next Christmas, he got me one of these fancy dog biscuits made of organic ingredients and stuff. He said, just in case you get stranded again, you can eat this biscuit, right, to keep, keep it with you in the vehicle. But eventually the plows came. They came in the afternoon instead of a day and a half later. They made a special trip up there just for us. I couldn't believe it. This never happens, at least that I know of. I was so thankful, but I wonder why in the world did this happen? Here's some of the aftermath. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it, this is in the east of Rapid City, and this is the light area. I often wonder why in the world did I get nudged to go there a day and a half early? Why did I keep going when I got stuck in that gas parking lot? Why did I keep going when I'm looking my head out the window or when I'm opening the door? And why did I stop where I stopped? I could have went a day later and I would have been just fine. I could have went when I thought I was going to go. Instead of listening to that elder, I could have went. I would have been just fine. But what would have happened to this man and this woman? She was afraid she was going to die. It was her birthday two days later. She thought, I'm not going to live to my next birthday. She told me that afterwards. She was so thankful. I'm so thankful you were there. We tried to call out. We tried to call out. We couldn't get anybody. They were out in the middle of nowhere, literally. In the middle of nowhere. Oftentimes the storms happen. Not, it might be a growing experience for us, but also Jesus thinks of others. Thinks of others that we can help. We go through storms and we can comfort them. We can be there for them. We can help them. Just being there with them because we've been there before. Jesus went through that storm for somebody else. And I want to just encourage you, if you're going through a storm, think about maybe there's somebody else. There. That guy probably would have died of a heart attack there. Let's just get real. He would have been stubborn. He would have been out there 60 day mile an hour winds. He would have stopped because his wife, he wasn't listening to his wife until I said something. He, went, he couldn't call 911. He would have been out there, kept trying, kept trying to dig out, and he would have had a heart attack because you know he would have went forward with, with or without me uh, that morning through those drifts. Lord sends us through storms. And sometimes we're saying, oh, it's cold. Oh, we've got to eat dog biscuits. Oh, this is happening. That's happening. But we need to remember there are other people involved. There were other boats that day that were in that storm. A people who may or may not have believed in Jesus. And what did they see when they saw Jesus still that storm? He's the Messiah. And so your storm, how you handle that storm, you know, it might not be out in the Sea of Galilee, but how you handle that storm and, and how Jesus brings you through will help other people as well. Will help other people as well. Do you think there's going to be literal storms going on on planet Earth? Yes, you can read it in Luke 21. The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear of what's coming on the earth. Matthew 24, 8 says that these storms, these disasters will become more and more frequent, more and more intense, like a woman giving birth to a child. It says these are the beginning of sorrows, literally translated birth pains. These storms and what's going on in this world will become more and more frequent, more and more intense. And how many people do you think have peace during these storms, literal storms going on all around us? Very few. How many people are ready to die if need be? Very few. How many people are afraid to die? Most are afraid to die. They're not right with their maker. They have not accepted Jesus as their Savior, even though they've heard about Him. We need Jesus, folks. We need Jesus. We've neglected Him. Maybe we've even rejected Him. We think, well, He's not going to accept us. He will. 
when we have no peace, when we're busy and desperate and our substitutes are medicating away the lack of peace, Jesus says in John 14, 27, I will give you a peace that the world cannot give. Question is, will we accept it? Will we humble ourselves and accept it? Will we admit, like the disciples, we tried everything. Let's give Jesus a chance. Inside the church and outside the church, we need Jesus. And so I put up on the, on the board there, it's my decision to say, Jesus, I'm sorry that I've neglected you. Thinking that I'm the most important. This is straight from my heart to his. If you want to join in this decision, you can. I'm sorry that I've tried to medicate my lack of peace with everything but you. I want the storms in my life to cease. Please speak peace to the storms inside and out. I humbly, I humbly ask for help. I told you I'd give you an opportunity today if you'd like to come forward to give your storms to Jesus. Not to me, but to Jesus. If you'd like to come forward and, and give storms inside and out to Him. I don't know how it's going to work out for you, but He will bring peace to the situation in His way and in His time. So if you have a storm in your life, Maybe you haven't neglected Jesus, but maybe this stuff is just coming on you strong and you want to give that to Him. Maybe you have neglected Jesus and the storm's coming because of it. Maybe you're like the demoniac. You've got a storm inside you and you want to be set free. Give it to Jesus. I want to invite you forward this morning to give it to Jesus and to have special prayer together. There's nothing that I can do, but only He can give peace. And so if that's your decision this morning, I'd like to extend the call to you to come forward and give that storm to Jesus. Give that trial to Jesus, and he will speak peace. I'm just going to give you a few moments as we conclude. If you'd like to slip forward, and maybe some music can play as we make that decision together. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to take my storms and give peace, to speak peace to the situation.